slide, please do so. <laughs> and uh, today we have a wonderful speaker, Jory, and I will uh, introduce her a little bit later. Before we go on, I also want to talk about this uh, speaker series that we have. Uh, we now open up every Wednesday as an uh, open office day, so anybody can come uh, 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock, use our facility to work and collaborate. Um, we also um, have speakers coming in for sure every other Wednesday, uh, focus on a, a seri serial entrepreneur uh, like Jory and investors that come in and talk about their insight, how they make a decision about who they invest in, some of the things that we would love to hear. And um, one of the things that I want to talk about is the Women's Startup Lab isn't just the getting together and having a great content speaker, but we're really focusing on each entrepreneur and a community helping out each other. So at Women's Startup Lab, I don't have a thing, but there is a, a character, two stroke together, that it's called Hito. So that's the Japanese character, the two people leaning on each other means human. And with that philosophy, uh, we encourage everybody here to practice action, three action of Hito. So one is when you get to know each other and learn about who they are, what kind of startup they do. You might not remember all first and last name, their first last name or name of the company, but one of the things that we really encourage all of you to um, consciously uh, promote each other. Um, you leave here today and said, oh, I met this amazing woman. So talk about it. We need more of us promoting other women. And the other thing is obviously introduction. Specific actions introduce anybody from here to somebody else. It means a lot. You know, we connected to a lot of people and many of those network came from because of the introduction. And so we encourage all of you to do that. And then the other thing is work together. Many of our uh, founders and alum who graduated our program, once they're done with their company, going through exit, anything else. They actually tied up and start another company. Uh, one have a became investor to other company. And uh, often, uh, male out there, they have a lot more deeper connection and money. And they do that all the time. And while they're building a company, they also have this strong desire that they want to have fun and work together based on the trust that they built. And I think uh, we have less women out there having that um, Found with, and we have to make extra conscious effort to specifically try to work together. And so don't be shy about it. Um, Sometimes um, we encourage you to just um, have all of you come back every Wednesday so that you don't have to scramble through uh, another meeting time to have a coffee and get together, but just practice showing up here every Wednesday. Um, there's any way that we can help to introduce you to others, we will do. But hopefully uh, every Wednesday is something that you consider, consider uh, freshening up your routine, meeting interesting people, and really practicing what makes us special, which is the Hito uh, spirit. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Jory. Many of you might know, Jory has been the uh, co-founder of a blog her. One thing I was very, very impressed with uh, blog her and also her is there's a three amazing, uh, very strong-minded women started, three co-founder. And over 10 years, they stuck together. Meantime, they also um, not only had this ambitious, they got together, they had a kids, first the kids, second kids. The company continued to grow, their life changed, um, many other obstacles came through. And I think it's an amazing story that uh, many of us don't get to hear um, how they uh, put the team together and continue to grow. And today's about the scaling a company. It's not about the co-founder. But with that background, I think um, I have a very special place admiring what she has done. And it really shows what women can do together and working together. So without further ado, maybe you can tell more about your background. And we're so honored to have you today. Jory. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. <laughs> bringing that up um, because I did want to have a few words about my work with Women's Startup Lab. Um, just by very quick background, my company, I co-founded Blow Up Her in 2005 with two co-founders. We exited in 2014. Um, at the time, we were the largest women's digital media play and um, we combined with our next 
largest company, which made us really big. And um, then I stayed on for a year with the new company. And while I was doing that, I was working on strategic alliances and I started to take on more advisory roles. And that's when I knew that I was addicted to continuing um, to build companies, not necessarily as a founder, but as an advisor. So that's what I've been doing for the last several years. Uh, I work as an advisor to startups, largely at the post seed stage, and I'll tell you why in a minute, and that's gonna be a big reason or, and focus on this talk. But the thing that I really loved when I started working with them in Startup Lab is I didn't realize as a founder, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur where I found that I, my co-founders and I had started this event. We had a ton of people that attended, and a bunch of investors came up to us and said, hey, have you thought about maybe also doing a fundraise? We're like, for what? We don't have a, a we were just, this was a project is what this is. In fact, we were bloggers.org at the time. And then we realized if we really thought about what this, this community was asking us to do, we could build business behind it. And that was when we started thinking about the digital side. And that's when we started to raise money. And then I had to quickly, very quickly learn what, what, all of this entailed. Um, but the thing that really struck me about Women's Startup Lab is that um, while you always are gonna get advice about how to build your company, scale it, get fundraising, et cetera, um, get funds, you don't really think about the head game that's involved. And I think that Women's Startup Lab has done such an amazing job addressing just so many other things about co-founders, about the dynamics of leaders and when women get together in particular, and who's gonna run the company, and how do I assert that when you're my co-founder? Things like that, that kind of get us caught up very early on, and we really don't have time for it, um, but we have to address it. I so appreciate, and, and having been a mentor now twice with the Women's Startup Lab, I really appreciate some of these other issues that um, I've seen play out with even experienced entrepreneurs and how just as much as getting funds and, and fundraising, you have to understand how these things play out over time. So I'm, that's my, my plug for Women's Startup Lab. Um, so two other things that I'm working on that I think um, could be relevant for you. I, in addition to advising startups, work with a group called Index Ventures. Index, when I was building my company, I used to call on CMOs and heads of marketing. And they became not only my clients, but they became friends and professional colleagues. And several of them have now left their respective companies. And we've created a consortium of high level decision makers and big companies who help startups figure out how am I going to make a difference when I get to that level. Um, when you get to series A, series B, you have to start getting the big partnerships in your space to show that you are hitting your milestones. And this is where a lot of companies get caught up. They get the big partnership. You ever see that commercial? There's, I think it's an Amex commercial, or it's, I can't remember now which commercial. It was an old Super Bowl commercial where this company, they start getting orders, and at first there's like one order, two orders. They just launched their website, then there's three orders, and they're all like, yeah, yeah, and then there's 50, and then 200, and then it just starts to go off the hook, and they're getting all these orders, and they're like, you know, completely overwhelmed. That's that is like the high class problem that you would experience and have to deal with at the series A and B level. And it's the kind of thing that we address with, with index. Um, we work with founders that are really ready to position their brand for scale, trying to understand what that looks like to a scaled partner. The other thing I'm working on um, with a, a very good friend of mine in the corporate development space is called Tribal Ventures. And Tribal works with companies that are the Series A and B who are thinking of exiting. Now, we don't think about exiting typically at that stage, and yet really that's when you have to start thinking about your exit plan. So we work with founders to, in some cases, actually orchestrate their exit because maybe they realize they're not ready to keep going. And I want to talk a bit about that for the Series A and B too. Um, however, you do need to think about it because sometimes these things crop up and then you realize, wow, I'm in an exit scenario and I never planned for it and I never positioned for it. So these are two of um, my projects of late and I'm, I'm loving the work. I feel like I'm in the entire ecosystem because 
each time as a first time entrepreneur, I got caught up at these stages. So I feel very compelled to, uh, to work with other founders on this. So with that in mind, I will touch on um, the topic for today, which is about, um, which is about scaling in series A. I know we don't have time since this is being taped to talk about everyone's situation this very moment, but just so I have a sense, how many of you are currently raising for Series A? How about I will be. you will be okay, or thinking about your Series A? And how many are at C right now? Okay, this is good to know because um, I think there's a lot of changes that are happening in the space. The seed is what used to be the Series A. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are changing and there's different milestones. So it's okay if you're not ready for the Series A yet, you should kind of know the difference because um, there's, there's something that uh, an effect that we call the brick wall effect. This was something that was popularized by another investor, uh, Elizabeth Yin, formerly of 500 Startups. Now she has her own fund called the Hustle Fund. And what she found during her work at 500 startups is there were a bunch of startups that were getting their early stage funding um, they go through the accelerator and they were sort of um, having a moment while they're in this accelerator think about Y Combinator or any accelerator for that matter and then you present to investors you generate all this interest and then what either you get your money and then you keep you use that money and then you hit a wall because that's where the introductions end and the funding ends, or you never got that money. And you go through the accelerator and that's it. So there is an effect that we're finding with a lot of seed stage companies where they're hitting a brick wall, or in some cases, uh, angel companies as well, where they get that initial round of funding, they're like, woohoo, get very excited about it, and then crickets. Either they, they can't make it past their launch, they can't hit a milestone to get to the Series A. Um, all of these things play into the, the brick wall effect. Another issue with the brick wall effect is um, the investors expect you to be as lean as possible, get as much done without getting necessarily the expertise that you need in the door. So you do a lot of haggling for resources. You hire kids out of school who have never done this stuff before. And you, in, in many cases, founders find that they're cycling and that they're doing a lot but not getting to the milestones they need to get the real expertise and skill that they need to get to that Series A. So I want to talk a bit about that. Some of the um, things to look out for, things to start planning for to get to that Series A, and um, some takeaways because I know Ari likes takeaways, and some ways just to kind of keep yourself in that state of mind around Series A. Okay. So I will start just with with my own situation and. Part of the reason why I'm really obsessed with Series A is because um, when I was going through the process back in 2006 and 2007, seed was less of a thing. Seed rounds existed, but in general, first time entrepreneurs closed angel funding and then went right to the Series A. In my case, I didn't have any angel funding. I went right from uh, basically bootstrapping for 18 months to a series to a three million dollar series A. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I think that it's really hard to do. We were really fortunate. Um, I don't know if, if many entrepreneurs can can recreate the kinds of scenarios that we found ourselves in where we had a lot of press, we were a first mover, we had revenue coming in from companies who were basically saying how do we work with you and we had to figure out a business model on the fly versus figuring out your business and your business model and then going out and getting customers. We had to actually build to what we were getting in the marketplace. And so it was fairly easy going to investors where we already had revenue coming in and they're like, okay, just add water. It really wasn't that easy, but that was the pitch. Just add water and we're ready to go. And then we found ourselves uh, doing more scale deals, pulling in um, multiple deals, and hitting certain milestones, and we didn't even realize we're hitting those milestones. I now realize why we got to the Series B and the Series C. But so many founders, especially now, where so many of us now do need those seed funds because we're starting from scratch, or we're building something that is really tech intensive, so we really need capital early on, I'm now seeing where they're getting really blocked 
and where it's really difficult for them to get to that next round of funding. So, um, so with that in mind, I want to just share a bit of what I'm seeing, where I'm finding investors are netting out, what they're telling me they're looking for, just so you have a sense of what you may want to start planning for. So in this room, who's got technology yet? Who's raising money for technology? Okay. And also, what okay. we already have part of the software that is raising more money for our Yes. And this is sort of the chicken egg scenario we find ourselves in, is especially for first time founders, we have to have something to prove, and yet we need money to prove it. Mm -hmm. So we're always gonna have that dance. I have um, a founder that I have been working with for some time. She was first time founder, but a very experienced um, digital media leader. And she want, wanted to go right into a $5 million seed round because what she does requires a lot is capital intensive Ooh, if that's me no thank goodness no you're fine okay. i'm like this is my ring i don't know what okay um and i and i said to her we're gonna have to find some back roads because first of all that's a really big seed secondly no vc is going to give you that kind of money as a first-time founder so what she started to do instead was build a platform. Before it became really heavy with content, she built a list, a platform. These were actual assets that she could say, check a box, I've got 150,000 people on my list. I've got this many pieces of content. And she was able to do strategic partnerships that weren't for the really strong and heavy, um, heavily funded content that she was looking for funding for, but at least an initial amount of content. What an investor is looking for at this stage is some sort of a track record. So you have to make one. Um, not all of you are in media, some of you are maybe in other forms of technology, so I'm happy to, to talk a bit more one-on-one -on -one about what that starting point looks like, but they need something to chew on, right? We always hear it's all about the founding team, not necessarily. The founding team is important, but any kind of a milestone. I'll tell you, when I got my, my Series A, we were first-time founders, but we had lists, we had, um, we had customers, we had, um, we had users, we had repeat users. So I always recommend starting a dashboard. And that dashboard can be a simple spreadsheet you've created from Google Analytics, right? It just shows that you're plotting, that you have A, a site or something that is being measured. B, there is growth on that. Um, revenue is probably unlikely at this phase, but at least you can show growth in users or you can show growth in traction of any kind at this point. Um, the primary areas of traction, of course, are product, and being able to show that you have a product, that people are using that product, and that they're increasing their usage on that product. Users, um, you can also count engaged users. So I'll give you an example and something that I'm very familiar with, media. You may not have registered users, but can you show that people are clicking on the content you're sending out on your newsletter, that they're at least coming to visit? Um, and then if they're coming to visit, can you later show that they're coming back? These are things that you can at least start to show even before you've got paying customers, so to speak. Um, it's gonna be different across the board for everybody, but these are the kinds of milestones that they're gonna be looking for. Um, I wanna talk about missteps, <laughs> because these happen <laughs> a lot. Some other things to bear in mind. As I said before, the last thing you may be thinking about is your exit. You're just thinking about getting a company off the ground and funded. That said, you should be thinking about the revenue you're bringing in, or I should say the capital that you're bringing in, and what you intend to do with that. Probably the biggest mistake I have seen with a Series A fundraise is that you're not truly being realistic about the outcomes of your company and you're raising money to help you get to here without realizing how big you're gonna need your company to be in order to make it worthwhile for, for an investor. So I'll give you a really good example. 
my founder that was looking for five million bucks. I said, wow, that's a series, that's a C. And then you want a 10 million series A, and then she was gonna, I think at 20 million series B. So for that kind of money, you're gonna have to exit at at least 500, right? For, in an investor's mind, for them to be willing to put that in. And, and she thought about it and was like, huh, well, I'm not even sure yet. She had not yet planned how that would even get to that level. If you don't have an idea of how big it will be, it's really hard to know what you should be asking for. Just know in an investor's mind around a series A, and this is different with say uh, an angel investor who, yeah, they want to see an outcome and a return, but they're not thinking X and 10 X or seven X or whatever X your industry is. You have to think about what they're looking at. I know a wonderful founder in consumer digital media. Well, she's not digital media. She's consumer digital. She says it has to be 10 X or I'm not putting in an early stage. Just not going to do it. If there's no path to 10 X, whether they hit it, of course, we know statistically is not, is not likely, but if there's, if you know at the outside and you cannot explain how you're going to get to that level, you shouldn't be asking for that. Um, media is a great example of an industry that has raised far more money than it can substantiate in exits. Media sales right now are way down. Like we're looking at like 50 million is a good exit on a scaled media company. And yet they're taking in 50 to 100 million. So that's a problem. And down the line, you're not gonna be able to scale to that. And so investors are starting to get are starting to get smart to that and understand like this is not a good area I want to be in. So think about what and how you're going to get to that multiple. What is it that's going to get you there? Um, it may not be the case. You may say, you know what, I'm really developing a business that's going to be a $10 million business. Great, but you don't need a Series A for that. So I'd say that's one mistake to avoid is not being realistic with your outcome. And I know when I did it as a as an entrepreneur. I knew we needed money. I was like, wow, three million. Sure, we're just gonna keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. It wasn't until I was about seven years into the business where I realized that we had to back into a reason to justify the kind of multiples that we were talking about. Um, obviously, we had, we had a good story up to that point, but that story was changing as media models were shifting and we needed to have new reasons to get to that. Yeah. Can you slow down just a little and sure. explain what, what did happen with your growth sure. at, that, at that particular time? Were you growing to the level yes. and how did you do that? Yes, so um, in our case, we were a network effect. So not everyone has that has a network effect kind of built into their model. Um, what we did have and what got us the Series A was that we had a very easy Path. We had, in essence, a petri dish where we said, look, we got here to here with this much. So you, utilizing these resources. Now we can show you a path where with this much money, we now know we can, uh, based on our previous growth, leverage that network. Yeah, leverage the network. But also we were able to see what the growth patterns were. For instance, we had one community person who was, who was recruiting new bloggers into the network. And those new bloggers had an average of 50,000 unique visitors each. So we knew that we would very likely get to at least 50 million monthly unique visitors with this much money within this much time. And we actually created a dashboard and hit those numbers. And so then with that, you can go back to series A and get to the next phase. But I think um, without having any kind of, of model and just saying, yeah, well, I'm hoping for 150,000 users by this, and I'm hoping that once I buy the technology or you know the the resources to develop the technology, I will get to here to here with no reason for that because you have you've not had any benchmarking done up to that point. It's really hard for an investor to make that connection, especially if you're a first time founder. If you're a multi time founder and you make that same argument. They may give you a pass and say, well, you've done it before, you know, you know the deal. And you may even have a list, right? Or you may even have some, some uh, partnerships already established. But just being able to have any kind of benchmarking done is, is critical. And that's how we got our, our round. We were able to show that with minimal resources and one part-time person and no dedicated developers, we got from here to here. Now imagine if we had a 
dedicated developer and we had this and we had this and map that out for them and then it became very plausible. Right. I mean, we all going? know we want to go up and to the right. right. Got that. But uh, especially first time founders who have not operated at that level of scale have to have that mapped out. Um, the other, this leads me to the next thing that I often see um, as a real, as a real miss for entrepreneurs, especially when they get their seed, they're trying to get to series A and their investors say, okay, you've got to keep it lean. So they keep it lean and they don't get an experienced operator in there to help them at least figure out a model. That was part of the reason why we, we did index is that we were talking to companies that were kind of making promises they really had no way of keeping. How do you know you're going to get from here to here? Hopefully, with an experienced operator, they can at least give you some models of, hey, based on what I've done or what I've seen in the market, we know we can do this if you can at least start to plug this in. So to allocate those funds in your, in your fundraising process mm -hmm. to dedicate funds toward finding that expertise. Right. Um, so I've worked with founders who their growth strategy was to throw a lot of money at people who are gonna develop a lot of great content for cheap. Okay, what are you doing with that content? You now have a thousand pieces of content. What we're gonna throw up on our, on our Facebook page, really? And then what? How are your Facebook followers going to translate to a reason to fund you for something that's completely off of Facebook right now? So someone who knows the conversions, oh, well, here's how you would convert it. And a typical conversion rate for something like this, they can start to help you make those connections so that when you're talking to an investor, you have a reason, right? And by the way, you can rent those resources. Um, you, you're in no business getting, for instance, a CMO at a Series A, but you can get an advisor and you can get a consultant to come in who can at least give you some, you know, part-time analysis and help you on your way. Do you find that people don't know what kind of expertise they really need? Yes. Yes. Um, well, and in particular, my area, because I come from influencer media, I've often been asked to come to companies and they literally want me to go like make calls to really influential people. And I think like, that's a tactic. That's not, that's not a strategy. And no one would do that. Um, I, I will touch on influencer strategy because I've seen this as, as probably the number one growth tactic, especially in the consumer space. An influencer strategy is getting influencers to use your product and hopefully talk about it. And then you say, oh, look, we got media from these companies, which generally means nothing. And I say that as the person who used to head up an influencer marketing company. So it means nothing to your startup unless this is a customer. The one thing I will say to anyone who has asked me about influencer strategy at an early stage, if you're going to spend the money, spend it getting to, and these are, these are influencers as well, people who are going to be needing your product so much that they're willing to recommend it and get other people to sign up. I'll give you a great example. Um, company that I that I was uh, talking to, I was asked to to work with, is called Stylebee, and it's super cool. It's on demand beauty services. So if you're gonna, yeah, some people use it for a blowout before before speaking. Or um, I went to an event and they had a, a a squad of people that were there doing your hair and makeup before you got on stage to do the to do the panel, and they do these on site events, and they even did um, I think. Two Super Bowls ago, they did the wives of the people of the football players in Skybox. They had a team doing that. And what they realized is rather than get a bunch of people who might need the service and try to market to them with money they don't have, because that's a lot of money, they marketed instead to hairdressers, right? People who could join their squad. Why? Because they're going to bring their customers in. And they're going to be the ones that say a P and G who may want to sponsor want to get in front of, right? I want to give them the hair product because they're the ones that are going to use it on their customers. It's actually a better way to get to the customers than trying to run ads that are going to go in front of the customers. So I often say um, another thing to consider is who is your influencer truly, right? If you're doing a consumer app, think one removed 
from all like, uh, I know Cal Rue, right? You've got mobs. Of course you want to get in front of mobs. But what about one removed? It's like the moms that are going to need to talk about this because they need it. They need the app. So they're going to try to, they want the partnerships that you have to go out and seek because they need them so they can use the app. There's more strategic ways of figuring out your, your influencer model. And a lot of money gets wasted on Facebook ads and media. You just, you don't have money for it at this stage. Mm -hmm. In Series A, you should be establishing that, that inner circle of, of partnerships first. Something that's a lot about engagement is to figure out people that folks are how you make Yeah, it's engagement, but I, I would also say it's not just about, oh, I want to get someone to read my content. It's about someone who needs you. Another company that's that, a pain point, it's very relevant. Yes. That they're going to act upon it because it's a service or, or a product you have is actually going to solve something. Absolutely. So, so they're motivated to get their constituents. I'll give you another example. Uh, I worked with a, a fitness company and they did, um, they had podcasts. They helped these fitness instructors create their own podcasts so that they can have, they can have national audiences, international, right? Typically as a fitness instructor, you're training people in the gym or in one place and that's all that you can make, right? But if you can work with them, and then they market your podcast and they and these people subscribe, you have a much broader base. So at first, they, they had a lot of money going towards getting more people on the platform to sign up for the classes. But we worked on a strategy that got more fitness instructors. Why? Because then they're going to bring their, their folks from their gym. They're going to bring everyone in their physical world onto that platform as an additional revenue opportunity. And it worked for them and helped them to scale. And uh, I think, I don't know what their status is. They're getting serious, A, <laughs> But we hope it, hope it worked. Um, so that's, that's something to consider. I'd say the other thing to consider, and this sounds like a high class problem, but I'm seeing more and more founders facing this, is what we call the poison pill at the Series A. And that's when an institutional investor, so let's just say like the, the one that you want to buy you in the end, wants to give you money early. How can you possibly refuse that? And yet it comes loaded with a lot of stuff. I don't say don't ever take an institutional round for your Series A or even for a seed stage. I'm actually working with founders right now that are considering doing that, but you have to consider what that requires. A lot of institutionals have what they call operating agreements. And these are kinds of like, We'll give you the money if we can partner with you in this way. And sometimes those are for your benefit. Many times it's not. So I'll give you a totally undigital example of how this can work against you. You're a screenwriter and a big movie studio buys your script for what seems like a lot of money just so it doesn't compete with the big movie that they're really spending the big bucks on. So you've just taken a small check to go away. And this happens quite often with companies who are like, okay, we're actually putting a lot of money in this basket. We can afford to invest to keep you over here. Now, the problem with poison pills is you don't always know what the, what the situation is, but you should find out as much as you can. And if there's an operating agreement that comes with that money, you should determine early on whether or not it's to your advantage. Hmm. Without getting too in the weeds about, because it, it differs for every, for every um, field. But consider if you're in a high tech field, for example, and you're doing some really great work in AI, and Google wants you now. Okay, that's really interesting, but maybe Google is creating something that they really don't want competing with what they have. They can very easily buy you away. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to get Apple hired or, or exiting early. But if that's not what you want for your exit, and this is what I mean about knowing what you want and where you realistically think you can go, then you just cut your company off at the knees by taking that round of funding. So that would be my other warning. Uh, I have one more thing that I think would be um, is critical to know. And that is, this goes back to the, um, the FedEx example, and I still don't know if this is a FedEx ad, but, but the example of the company that suddenly found they had all these sales coming in, it's a high-class problem, but this is where a lot of companies fail. 
Uh, a venture, uh, a VC, once wrote a great blog post that really explained what I think a lot of companies get wrong. Early days, you want sales. You want to get people in. You want to get them in. But you don't think about how to repeat it, how to scale the operations, and it becomes, it's just as expensive to get business from them the first time as it is the second, the third, the fourth. And there's no way that you're keeping that customer. A lot of companies snip around and give you the business because they want to check it out or they're, they're trying to see there, is there a there there? A lot of them won't come back. So how do you keep them? Retention is more important than getting the big deal right up front. Working up to that deal is really important. Um, of course, in my space, especially with advertisers, you want to get the big dollars, but often those dollars made you work for it. And if you couldn't repeat that business, you don't have a repeatable model. And that is your series B right there. So series A, you get a shot. If you don't get it, and if you don't get repeatable business, and if your costs to operate only go up. You, now, this is a, an interesting paradox because you're taking in more money to help accommodate the scale. At the same time, you need to be more efficient with those dollars, and you have to be tracking how that looks. So you need to be hiring, if you're in a consumer business, more sellers, for example. But those sellers have to get more efficient. It has to take fewer phone calls, less work per seller to get those deals. You have to be continually operationalizing. And that's when you need to get operators who know how to do that. Versus we're just gonna keep going, 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 going and getting those deals done. So however that looks for you in your particular business, keep that in mind. Because that is, those are the numbers that are gonna matter. How does that work for you? So, um, this is an area that I don't think we, we nailed, <laughs> honestly. I think, I think we, we did okay. Um, we got our Series A, hired, hired really expensive sales talent, started to scale, 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 hit those numbers. So that was great. Series B, started to do some really big deals, like scale deals. But um, some of them were one-off, right? And we needed to maintain that. And what we also found is that it became really hard to fulfill on some of these deals. We, um, we didn't think about the back end. So we just sold a seven figure campaign that's gonna require a lot of resources, original video, we need to hire videographers, we need to hire whatever, right? However this looks for your industry. So the deals became more expensive to do. And until you are able to scale those operations, it's always, you're always going to be chasing after that. So even though you're getting more revenue, you're going to eventually have to deal with it by your C round, be more efficient. And that's why you see a lot of companies start to dump talent after their C or, you know, because then they know that they have to exit and they're just not efficient enough. They've kind of ramp, 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 but what, not become what efficient. So we were selling advertising and digital media uh, campaigns. And you were having to reinvent your, your, your working process or recruit different teams for each different campaign. You didn't have any kind of streamlined process. So we, we have some streamlining. We, we got people in who knew how to operationalize and scale that organization. But it was something that we started to see after our Series B, like, okay, where's the repeat business? And how much is it costing us to get this business, right? And we were burning through. And so we, we had to, we figured it out, but we had to come to that conclusion. So it's about, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure to take the money and scale, scale, scale. But if you're not thinking about operationalizing it, automating it, reinventing the wheel for every deal, then and did you solve that problem? And we did. You, we did, and I think we were still solving it when we sold. I think that we we had started to automate a number of our processes, which actually became very um, was useful. It was our technology that was part of the attraction mm -hmm. and the way that we had already operationalized what was mm -hmm. usually a very um, heavy lift, bespoke kind of business. Mm -hmm. yeah. But hopefully you learned earlier. <laughs> this, this might be very far afield from your core area of expertise, but if you're in a situation where um, 
getting lots of eye eyeballs is not valuable, in, except in the investor's eyes. And you have to educate the investor that building trust and safety slowly is more valuable. And I'm specifically talking about the digital mental health app. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, what I'm finding in those conversations is they have a traditional question that they ask and they don't understand how it's irrelevant for the category. Okay. Right. Um, that's an issue either with the investor, you need an investor who understands that more, or you need to find a different metric. You're not always going to be able to, to train the investors, right? The investors know what the investors want yeah. to know. Yeah. And some are willing to take your word for it, but. Well, a lot of people have jumped into the category without any kind of healthcare background. And so, you know, they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. And are you going specifically to, um, to experts, to folks that are very heavy into healthcare? Well, that's actually a, a question I have for you. I, right now, I've tried to avoid any investor that already has an app in the category um, and trying to find someone that um, has general category expertise, but not something that would be closely a competitor or even an indirect competitor. So I've been taking that approach. Um, so, I don't know if you care to comment. So, I would say, oh yeah, it sounds like a good strategy, but I've seen it work both ways. There are companies that, um, VCs where I said, no way, we're not going to them, they already have an investment in such and such, right? But what one VC finds competitive, another VC finds is a competitive advantage. We specialize. This is kind of where we, where we live, right? Uh -huh. I mean, there's some, there's some areas of crossover you really can't get past. Um, I think you should try and look and see what you hear. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what if you operate in a space where uh, there have not been attractive exits? So, let's say, so hypothetically, Carol, my, my company, right? It's a family productivity app for parents, right? To help them coordinate schedules and logistics with each other. In the family tech space, per se, there have not been good exits. Mm -hmm. um, the closest competitor, Cozy, was bought for, I'm guessing, low, low double digit probably teens, you know, of millions, which by yeah. these standards is not a good outcome, no. right? There were productivity apps that sold for 100 million to Microsoft in both cases, Wunderlist and Sunrise. Um, but again, there's nothing, and so one of the objections that I get, or one of the concerns that I get from the investors is, show me by pointing to companies that were bought for, or that were yeah. public or were bought for a billion dollars or whatever, that your space is an attractive they can't manufacture things out of the air, right? They don't exist. So how far afield can I go, right? And say, well, this is kind of like this. It's squint until the end, <laughs> just so, right? It's, you know, there's an analogy here. Right? Maybe it's a business model commonality. Right? Maybe it's a target audience commonality. Maybe it's something, right? Or do you just do you go and look for the investors who don't make it a deal breaker for them and basically say, I know that there's not been a lot of successful exits in this space, but by golly, you can do it because you have something unique. There's something, you know, you have a unique point of view, unique insights into the industry, unique something or other, whether it's a marketing yes. strategy, a business model, or whatever. So, so I, I, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So being in media, mm -hmm. media multiples. I mean, we, right before, as we were building our company, HuffPo, sold, HuffPo Huffington Post, mm -hmm. sold for like 300 some odd million. Right, I like it's pretty good outcome, and then nothing happened. Like it just wasn't generating the revenue, so everyone else was like, "Well, that was a big waste." And then every other media company after that had to deal with a very different multiple scenario. Right, so what we did, and this may apply for you, is we we're like, "Well, wait a minute, we're not just a media company. We also developed this proprietary technology for managing influencer campaigns, which was another big area of interest with, with investors, um, and." I, to some extent to investors, but I think they're more interested in the automated side. So that's when we started to double down in our efforts to, to look at that the platform sale mm -hmm. and to establish a platform so that we were no longer a media company, that was sort of the pivot, but a tech company that really focused on this particular aspect of media. So there may be ways to kind of 
play that game to your point, right? Justin. So yeah, so you can position it like you've seen those companies that are positioning to to Microsoft, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you're focused on a, on a different market. Mm -hmm. All those other companies are focused on the work. We're focused on professional as it hits the family, mm -hmm. right? And then you show how big that market is. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something that investors are looking for is ladder growth. And, and yeah. it's not just tilting your head, it's actually having something that other people can make money from, yeah. right? If you took that away from the equation, I'm still interested in how you would have built that media company without that platform that you could have leveraged, that you did leverage. You know. We wouldn't have been able to. I, I think initially we did. Okay, so we're 100 million units. That's pretty big. Um, we, we had a network effect because, in essence, our, our customer and what we spent our time on was not the reader, even though we ended up with 100 million monthly uniques. It was on the blogger and the blogger who is very heavily incented in growing her audience. So the more we enable her to do that, the more audience she brings. So if you can find that sweet spot in your audience, right? So the same thing with the fitness instructors, right? It wasn't about getting all to all of those people looking for a fitness class, uh, a podcast. It was about getting to those fitness instructors who really wanted to expand their own opportunities and were willing to start marketing this to their offline customers. So that's a great way uh, for a network effect. And that's, I'm talking mostly in consumer, which is where I play most. Did that feel satisfying for you, or did it feel like it was taking you away from some of the core mission that you started with? Our core mission was helping these guys monetize. We were helping bloggers at the time, then later content creators and social media influencers build their audiences. So they were our customer. But the market and the advertisers wanted to know how big the overall readership was. And we thought, well, we're not going out for all of those guys. We're going out for the bloggers. We're going, we had the biggest bloggers that existed, right, at the time in our network. So they were able to bring in their readers. Made it a lot easier. You make them happy. You make their audiences happy. So figure out what that smaller concentric circle is. Even if to the market, this is what you're bragging about. You're really describing a B2B to C. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Another question. So um, I've explicitly chosen to make my app free. When we actually launched uh, a few months ago, we were we used to have a premium subscription in our model, um, but because we're still pre PMF, right? You know, pre product market fit. We're trying to prove that you know the market doesn't want what we built, and we're about to launch much better, uh, much more, uh, but also much more targeted, you know, version of the of the product across all the different platforms. Um, so we can, I've chosen to actually yank the business model out completely. So the app is completely free, no ads, no money of any kind, uh, because we want to prove that consumers want this app and that it has a very high engagement, very high retention. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that matters, right, for a consumer app, is not just ability to get downloads, but ability to get users that use the app daily, yeah. or hopefully in our case, multiple times a day, because there's nothing optional about being parent. Great you have to pick up your kid and drop Great off metrics, and all now, when it comes to Series A, you know, uh, do you know of successful companies that you've been personally involved in or have consulted with or whatever that chose to delay the introduction of monetization or business model, right? Uh, and how far yes. can you delay it? I you think know, that's, that's more like common of a tactic than, right. than charging up front. I mean, there. I think subscription model is becoming more of a thing because the advertising is is going on crapper, yeah, because <laughs> digital advertising is having a, a rough time. That said, um, especially in your market, it's too saturated to start charging up front. I mean, I think just right. realistically, it doesn't make any sense. If you can show that there's that there's um, very avid user engagement, that's the same thing. That's money. That's money. And so if the user metrics and the engagement metrics and the growth is there, right, the investors wouldn't demand, you know, show Look at Pinterest, the my yeah. God. Yeah. They waited until I think their right. Series E before they even made right. money. Maybe it was T. I don't know. But they, they had a huge user engagement that they, that they mm -hmm. used as their right. value that right. gave them the valuation, right? So same thing works with, with an app. I mean, any, any, especially in consumer, because you've got to get through the clutter. Right. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm not getting any pushback from the investors and on that thing, right? Like nobody debates the value 
of becoming ubiquitous in the app that moms, you know, use, yeah. right? Daily. No question that there's value there, right? Because women famously, you know, are 50% of the population, control 80 plus you know, percent of the consumer spend. Right. Right. Uh, so no question that it's a very, very valuable audience. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad to you know, there's another way. Yes, way to the there's another the way to skin this cat, though. So you, I think we've been talking about partnerships with last last week. Should catch up. But we were talking about partnerships you can have in place where you would be getting a revenue share. Now, right. even if that's pennies at this right. point, just having those in place and then showing the user growth, mm -hmm. I think a VC can can put two and two together and say, oh wow, okay, there's monetization no matter what, even before the subscription kicks in. Right. So I think that some folks experience, some apps, some companies experience a drop off once they hit, once they throw out a subscription basis because it kind of proves who are my real customers, right? Um, but that said, if you can even show that there's some revenue there even before that, that's something that can help make your case. In other words, the money doesn't have to come from the customers, the end consumers, yeah. right? It can come from partners, right? So um, yeah. someone I, that I'm working with on the media side, right? They want to, they, they have a lot of expensive media that they would want to create. So they're working with brands who are going to pay them to start developing it before they even apply an advertising model or a subscription model. So I, I do call one of the tactics right, for the apps. Mm -hmm. So you want to do the A-B testing link, so one is with subscription, one is with free, until it becomes popular. Or so you can get like, you know, just the downloads, and then those are the things on the metrics that you're, that you're measuring. So if you play with that, like, you know, one week you keep that, like, you know, pain, and the next week you make it free. And then there are several places your app gets kicked off, and then say, hey, this became free. And then you get more and more users to download it. So your users will download for some really high. And seeing that one of the apps did that. Yeah. I mean, for us, we were never a paid app and we never will be a paid app. Yeah. Um, so it's never an upfront thing. And so um, and it's it's a very tricky thing to do to uh, to A B test, yeah. right? Because or do even the time base, like one week off, you know, one week on, because it's something that we want to actually position as a strategy, right? Like yeah. it's a marketing yeah. message, it's like it's free. Like don't worry about no money, money. Yeah. right? And you can't just go, well, this week, worry about money. Next week, don't worry about money, right? So it's, it's hard to AD test. But I see a point about, in general, I'm a big fan of empirical, like let's just measure try both ways. Right. 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 So since we're getting into some yeah. deeper, into some weeds, I think we're going to wrap up the video yeah. portion of this. Yes. And yeah, we're, we're close to the hour anyway. So thank you very much. And happy to spend a few minutes afterwards just talking. Um, yes, a few minutes. Unfortunately, I don't have too much. Too much time, but thank you, Ari, for having oh, me. Thank you. We talked all day uh, long about this. Did so. you have a chance to talk about your takeaway and any other secret takeaway tools is, and app that you yes. share? Yes. Um, so I had mentioned dashboards. Start a dashboard. What does that look like? It looks exactly as you need it to look like. Um, I remember we had it was a simple weekly update for how many new users were coming to the platform. What was the retention rates for those users? I mean, it changes based on what your particular um, area of the business is, right, or what what um, field you're in. But it's important to have because that's all that they're going to be looking for at this stage. They're going to need to know that there's some traction. So develop it. I use Airtable. It's very, very Airtable. Yes. Okay. Because, because a lot of people can get in and out of it and you can track anything. Okay. It's really nice. So I use Google nice. Analytics that back into spreadsheets, but Airtable. All right. Right. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go, I just want to quickly announce to some of the people who's on online. Uh, in March, we will have with Trish Castero, who's the founder of Portfolio, will be speaking on March, March, 7th. March, 7th. March 7th. And then, then March 14th. Uh, following week, uh, March 14th, we will be having Phil Levin, who, who was founder of Evernote, speaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, we haven't had a chance to post it, but those are the speakers coming up. and. Uh, Obviously, you have a limited space, and uh, if you are interested, and make sure you register. And thanks again, and I look forward to seeing all of you. Okay. Thank you.